you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, indeed, we are looking at all aspects of subsidies in the energy sector. So if you want to build any kind of capacity with public money in the sector, then you should come and talk to us, or risk getting into trouble later. So why are we interfering in all these things? And what's the role of DG competition where it works? So as you probably all know, member states are increasingly relying on measures. I mean, I think this sector has always had a lot of state money behind it. And recently we see increasing reliance for security of supply, among other objectives, but um, for security of supply, member states are using capacity mechanisms of all different types to pay for capacity, of also of different types, uh, to be available to the system, to deliver things for the system, uh, and these we describe as capacity mechanisms. And we're interested in these measures because they usually involve state aid, public money is behind them, and that can have a distorted effect on the internal market. And under the general rules of the uh, European Union Treaty, it's, it's not allowed to use public money to, to distort markets, <coughs> because this leads to uh, subsidy raises and distortions to competition generally across the European internal market. Um, but there are, exceptions. there are exceptions to that general prohibition, and the state aid, of course, is widely used for certain objectives across Europe. So we have had specific rules looking at capacity mechanisms since 2014, when we introduced the Energy and Environmental Aid Guidelines. And uh, that, that introduced for the first time specific rules relating to capacity mechanisms or generational resource adequacy measures. <coughs> and then following those rules, because there were some indications that not everybody was necessarily paying attention to those rules, we launched a sector inquiry, so where we looked specifically at the use of public money for security of supply, and we looked into 11 member states uh, to try and get a better picture of um, how, how these uh, capacity mechanisms were being used and the extent to which they were involving state aid that we needed to look at in our cases. So what I'll talk about today is a bit about that sector inquiry, what we found, what, what, what lessons we learned from the different capacity mechanisms we've, we've encountered. I'll talk a bit about our case practice where we've looked specifically into many different capacity mechanisms now across, across the Union. I'll focus quite briefly because I think it's not, you know, it, the stage of the debate here, it's not, it's not worth going very detailed yet into, into uh, lessons learned on particular capacity mechanisms, but I, I focus briefly on one particular point of learning from our case practice and from the sector inquiry to do with making market signals work, and that's a message relevant with or without a capacity mechanism. And then thirdly, I'll talk briefly about one of the aspects of the clean energy package, the, the new electricity regulation. So the sector inquiry, as I mentioned, uh, looked in detail in 11 member states at what was happening in terms of capacity mechanisms and security of supply. This ran between April 2015 and concluded in November 2016. Um, and we found various things, among them 35 different mechanisms in just 11 countries. So really widespread use of these measures. And, and it, all different types. This is 35, so this was past, planned, uh, and existing. So not 35 all in use at the same time, but certainly more than 11 all in use at the same time, and many member states using more than one mechanism at, the, at once to, to uh, support security of supply in different ways. Uh, so we, we tried to differentiate and identify the different types of capacity mechanism uh, that you can see in the market. And here, this is a, the first basic distinction we make is between targeted and market-wide capacity mechanisms. Uh, and here, if we make an analysis and say, this is our peak, Electricity demand, this is the amount of, uh, well, this is, a, this is a peak demand. If you go for a targeted mechanism, you then make an analysis saying, how much capacity do I think will come forward in the market? And what you try and procure with your capacity mechanism is a top up, an extra bit on top of that, so that between what the market provides here and what your targeted mechanism provides here, in total, you have enough to meet peak demand meet your reliability standard. Uh, the alternative is a market-wide approach, where you say, I've looked at what I think peak demand will be, and based on that, what amount of capacity I need in the market to meet my reliability standard, and then I 
support in some way all of that capacity, and that's a market-wide mechanism. So these are the two, this is a kind of high-level distinction between two main types, and when people talk about strategic reserves, they're often talking about targeted mechanisms and capacity markets or uh, uh, market-wide capacity mechanisms are this type, B, market-wide. Just to go into a bit more detail about the, the differentiation of types that we found, we found six, we identified six types in the, in the sector inquiry, so among those 35 different measures, there were six different types. Mm, and this is mostly quite durable since the sector inquiry to kind of people's innovation and, uh, and what we've continued to find. Uh, and, but it still, it still mostly covers what we've, what we've seen and what we are seeing. And here, so you've got at the top, this differentiation between targeted and market-wide that I just described. And if we look on the next level down, you've got another differentiation here between volume-based and price-based measures. And in volume-based measures, the central decision maker's uh, decision to make and parameter to set is how much capacity do I want to support? <coughs> and then some kind of market-based measure is used to determine the price that has to be paid for that desired quantity of capacity to be uh, made available. And so the first two examples here, one and two, in a tender, it's a targeted measure, so it's a top up of capacity. It's volume based, so the, the system operator or whoever it is says, I require 500 megawatts of extra installed capacity. And then there's a tender in which offers are invited from the market to build a new power station or potentially deliver a new other type of capacity, demand response or storage, uh, to fulfill that, that, that need. The second one is where, um, oh, and then in the tender, in general, this capacity then participates in the market. So it's received, it's received public support to be built, and then it participates in the market. The second one is a reserve, where this amount is identified in a similar way to the tender, but then that, that is procured and then held outside the market. And, so is, and is only supposed to be used in specific circumstances that are diff quite difficult to define, but have to be defined in advance. And that's supposed to be kept outside the market and preserved in an attempt to preserve market functioning as much as possible. On the other side, you've got this price-based one. So here is where, having decided you need a measure, decided you need 500 megawatts of capacity, you then also decide what you think the right price is to pay for that capacity, rather than asking the market to tell you what subsidy it needs to provide the capacity. So it's a more centrally planning and less market-based approach to uh, capacity mechanism design. And there you just, you, so you set the price administratively and you pay it to a subset of the capacity of the market. Moving over to the right on the market-wide side, this differentiation here is the same, volume-based or price-based. Volume-based, you're setting the quantity, asking the market to tell you the price. And there are two more flavors here. But so number four is what we've called central buyer. This is a capacity mechanism where you say, oh, my peak demand is 10 gigawatts, I need 10 gigawatts of capacity to meet my peak demand. Uh, and, and then you have an auction in which anyone who can provide capacity is invited to offer their capacity through the auction and you pay for the 10 gigawatts that way with the price set at the auction. Uh, five is the French approach where rather than having a central buyer in one central auction, this 10 gigawatts is adequate, this requirement to buy 10 gigawatts is distributed among the different suppliers in the market and they're required to then make their own contracting arrangements with capacity on the generation or resource side to fulfill their supplier obligation. And so it's a decentralized procurement of, of, of capacity, but also <coughs> on the volume based side with the market setting the price. And then uh, over here you've got perhaps a price based approach, which is very similar to the targeted one here. So you decide that you need 10 gigawatts and you decide you're going to pay each of them 50 euros per gigawatt per year or whatever you decide the right price is and you need to pay them all. That's the, the old Irish system, it's a bit like that. So drawing conclusions, trying to draw conclusions from this variety of different measures we found, we, this is about a summary of our overall conclusions from the inquiry. And these four blocks correspond to the tests that we normally make in state aid assessment. So when we're looking at whether aid can be compatible, we have to say <coughs> that it's necessary, we have to find that it's appropriate to achieve a, a common objective, we have to find that it's proportional and, the, and it's the minimum is being paid that's needed to achieve that objective, and we have to see that it's designed in a way that protects trade and competition. So in terms of need, the first block, blocks here at the top, 
what we what we concluded was that market reforms are essential with or without a capacity mechanism. Lots can be done in the market. This has been carried through now in the clean energy package. There are, are firmer requirements for, for member states to do this. This is looking at things like uh, making sure that the, the balanced settlement process in the market is sending signals for flexibility as well as as well as long-term capacity needs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one in a minute. On the other side of the need box over here, we identified the need to have an economic reliability standard, just recognizing this trade-off in terms of cost and a level of security of supply that's sought. And the rationale for this is that, that consumers want to be insured. The, the kind of political rationale and economic rationale is the state is acting on behalf of consumers because there are market imperfections. And so if the state is acting on behalf of consumers, it should be careful how, how it acts and make sure that it's doing that in a way which constitutes value for money for consumers. Um, so what we were saying is here, there needs to be an economic reliability standard that makes an assessment of the cost of, of providing security of supply and compa compares that with the risks of supply disruptions and consumers' willingness to avoid those disruptions and so, so that the intervention can be kept at an appropriate level as well as seeing if it's needed in the first place. And yeah, and then here you see economic adequacy assessment. So you've heard a lot about that today already. This is looking in a, in a sophisticated, probabilistic way at possible scenarios and, uh, and uh, whether or not you need a capacity mechanism. And then if you, if, even if you, do, if you decide you do need one, this is crucial for determining the size of it. So moving down here, in terms of appropriateness, our conclusions roughly from the separate inquiry was that if, if there's a long-term if there's an identified long-term need and uh, the policymakers have a concern that there are enduring market failures that can't be fixed in a way that they are happy with, then a market-wide mechanism might be the most appropriate way to go because this is a way in which you take a quite long-term view. Normally these auctions are happening four or even five years ahead of the point at which the plants have to be built and the capacity has to be delivered. This is a way you can put new and existing resources into competition and get new resources built in the most competitive way when you think that if you think that new investment is going to be needed, it's not going to come forward without a capacity mechanism. Alternatively, if you think, and this, and this is in the end a bit of a philosophical question for market designers, there's a perfectly good economic case that you don't need a capacity mechanism at all, and people run excellent and highly efficient electricity markets in the world with no capacity mechanism. That is, that works. It also there are also uh, reasons why people are reluctant to trust those market forces in that way, and therefore that you can make a good case for having to have a capacity mechanism. But here, so this short-term thing is where we're saying, well, if you think that in the long term you can reform the market in a certain way, which means market forces give you the signals you need, and you don't need to rely on subsidies and state intervention, or if you've got some particular investment that's happening, like you know there's a big interconnection being built, but it's not ready yet, or there's a short-term disruption, like you are phasing out nuclear capacity and it is having a disruptive impact on the market, and until that's done, you need some kind of extra intervention. So here, short-term, if, you, if you're working towards the market delivering, but want a bridge, then this kind of strategic reserve, where capacity is put in reserve outside the markets, seems to be a useful solution. And then over here, we've, we've uh, got an extra category, which is where Member states sometimes see a local issue that they don't want to resolve with, with uh, fixes to the market or want to specifically support demand response and recognising that demand response could be particularly valuable in the end because if you fix fully the demand side in the electricity system, you do away with a lot of the political logic for intervening on the consumer's behalf. Um, so yeah, this category exists for these kind of specific situations, but we basically said those should be transitional and that there are alternative market-based ways of, of fixing these problems that should be uh, used in the long term. So on proportionality, so making sure you don't pay too much. You might remember from this slide, so I talked about this volume-based versus price-based approach. We basically said these ones, price-based, should not be used. This is difficult to ensure. It's very difficult to ensure proportionality with this, this approach. And uh, I mentioned that the Irish had a a model over here, they have this type of model, a price-based market, market-wide model. In 2016, they paid, so they, they, they identified the amount of capacity they needed, and they set the price centrally, and they set a price of 72 euros per kilowatt per year capacity. 
And now they've moved, sorry, I'm just a bit confusing, I'm sorry, I try not to switch too much people. So this was, this was what they were using, this model. They're now using this one. So a similar model, but the difference is they were setting the price administratively. They chose 72 euros in 2016. They ran an auction two years ago, and the, the price in the auction came out 41, I think. So a significant, a significant discount on the administrative set price by using a market solution to, to set the price. And that's, that's one example, there are others, of, of how much money can be saved, similar to renewable support. I mean, we, we are really urging everybody to use competitive forces and auctions where possible to set prices. So yeah, the administrative set one's not appropriate and not proportionate. In terms of trade and competition, we drew two main conclusions. So one is that these things should be open to all different technologies. It's not it's not, it's not appropriate, nor proportional, nor, nor, nor does it have an acceptable impact on competition if you say it has to be a CPPT of 400 megawatts. Because you don't know until you test the market what different solutions can come forward. And that's another big, big, a very interesting thing to see from the results of auctions. You see a real mix of technologies. You see much more demand response than people expected. You see more storage than people expected, both battery technology changing so fast. Uh, so yeah, open, it needs to be open to technologies, and then the market delivers not only a surprise on the price, but also a surprise on which technologies might be the ones that can best meet the need you've identified. And then over here, open across borders. So uh, we've presented in the report for the sector inquiry the model which is now in the legislation as, as a requirement for market-wide capacity mechanisms to be open across borders, because without that you create a, a, an unjustified advantage for domestic capacity over, over foreign. In terms of our case practice then, so we did a sector inquiry, finished it in November 2016, but in the meantime of course we have member states wishing to have state aid decisions on their mechanisms so that they can grant uh, subsidies to investors and investors can have confidence that that subsidy will not somehow be taken away later. So the decision is an important aspect in giving certainty, although that has limits. So if I go around this, we had a decision on the British scheme uh, in 2014. But this decision was annulled four and a half years later in the general court. So this is an example of how, it's just to be aware that at the moment it's, it's difficult to give regulatory certainty on this issue because as soon as you start designing these measures, there's a lot of focus on it now and it's, it's, they're, they're very complex and you can't avoid giving advantages and disadvantages, creating winners and losers through the, through the design of these things. I just, there's, there's no, we can say level playing field, we can say technology neutral, but you've got to define parameters for very, very many things in the design of these measures, which inevitably give advantages and disadvantages to different technologies and types of participant in a way which I don't think you can prove objectively is, is right or wrong. Uh, and so that means that there's some regulatory uncertainty persisting and likely to persist with, with these designs, which might be avoided if you avoid capacity mechanisms. And that might help uh, encouraging investment, actually. But yeah, so the, the British one is, is an old. A new decision is, is, uh, well, is in process. There's an investigation that's been conducted, so uh, we'll see what happens with that one. In Ireland and Northern Ireland, there's a jointly operated bidding zone across the whole of the island of Ireland. And one capacity mechanism, new one, looks quite a lot like the British one, but has a different product. I'm happy to talk more about these, but I'll just go through it quite quickly for now. In Germany, many schemes, so an interoperability scheme, this is a targeted measure paying um, uh, industrial users to reduce their consumption and deliver demand reductions. Network reserve, this is for redispatching basically because there's not enough transmission north to south, so this is paying parts here to stay available in a reserve and be redispatched if necessary. Also paying some foreign, foreign parts around that border. Capacity reserve. Is like a, strategic, a traditional strategic reserve, not enough overall capacity, so some capacity put in reserve. That's been approved, but I don't think put in, into practice. In France, this decentralized obligation scheme this is a market wide scheme, it's been running for a few years now. Uh, also a tender for demand response specifically. In Greece, uh, some interesting solutions. Really, the struggle in Greece is, is implementing the basic market rules, the, the, the target model is still in, in progress in Greece in a way which makes means there's been a, a kind of fairly unique case for specific uh, transitional measures there. In Poland, a uh, central buyer measure which looks quite similar to the British one. 
Um, and in Belgium, as you can see, it was a, a route similar to the German one. I mean, and so this Polish one, this is uh, in court. This one is in court. This one is annulled. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, there's, there's a lot of attention on this, and it's yeah, a challenge. Okay, so I'll move on to this, this, this point of learning from the sector inquiry I mentioned, which is, I think, relevant regardless of whether you end up with a capacity mechanism or not. So when you're designing the system, you want to achieve two things. If you're just thinking about security of supply and none of the other objectives for the system, just think security of supply at least cost. Then you want to use resources efficiently in the short term. You want to make the most of what is in the system. You want to have an efficient merit order and dispatch the right plants to meet demand in the most efficient way. And you want to, in the longer term, make sure that you have the right mix of resources to optimize the system in the short term. And so, what we found is that, of course, what people are doing is targeting a bit this, so the theory says you can achieve both of these by putting in place spot pricing, imbalanced settlement rules in the electricity market that mean prices rise to the value of loss load, maximum consumers are wish to pay to avoid disconnections. Uh, you can achieve both of these objectives by doing that with your short-term market pricing. And the, there should be no, there could be no better signal than short-term prices where imbalance prices reflect the full value of electricity and consumers are able as much as possible to participate in the market and reflect their willingness to pay for capacity. Uh, market participants have full balancing responsibility and so if eventually somebody is uh, uh, a power station is contributing to an imbalance and consumers are involuntarily disconnected, they face the full responsibility for the costs they're causing those consumers and locational prices reflect transmission constraints, so this is not seen very much in Europe. But this, uh, this is, there's a need to address what, where is the thing built, not just uh, how much is built and what type is it. But electricity prices can efficiently deliver those, those objectives. The issue when you introduce a capacity mechanism is that you're, of course you're, you're taking a long term view and you're trying to get enough capacity built for the future. But usually this also comes with some kind of obligation. So you participate in the auction and then four years later you're supposed to make your capacity available in the market. And if you don't do that, then you face some kind of penalties. If there's a scarcity situation, uh, people who've designed capacity mechanisms understandably want the people who they've paid to deliver their capacity to face some penalty if they don't end up delivering it and there is scarcity. And the problem is that creates this trade-off between those market signals that anyway this imbalance pricing signal that anyway provides a, a short-term signal for reliability and measures in the capacity mechanism that in a way compete with that. And you don't want the overall signal to be higher than the value of loss load from these two things, that would be very inefficient. So you have a difficult design challenge to match these things together. And what we found is that you just can't design in your capacity mechanism penalties that, that play as useful a role as electricity prices just because of the way we've designed the electricity market in Europe for the last 20 or 30 years, I mean, it's designed to be based on electricity prices. It's not based on capacity prices or any other subsidy support prices. Trading happens because of um, electricity price differences. Nothing to do with capacity mechanism contracts. And demand response in the market, real demand response that's not being subsidized is actual consumer reaction to market prices is reacting to market prices and nothing else. So, by fixing electricity spot prices and imbalance prices in particular, you can send strong signals for imports when you need them, and you can support demand response. And capacity mechanism penalties don't do these things. So that's why our conclusion was that the capacity mechanism can play a supporting role in the long term to make sure that the overall amount of capacity is available, but it won't be successful unless you also make market reforms uh, to send the right short-term price signals. Uh, that is essential because of the way the internal market is designed. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about briefly is the new electricity regulation. So, as you know, the clean energy package has eight different bits of legislation in it. One of those is the electricity regulation, and that one includes some new sectoral rules on capacity mechanisms. So you've already heard from Demetrius some of the rules related to adequacy assessment, but it includes more than that on capacity mechanisms. So, for example, um, Member states must set a reliability standard based on the value of loss load. A value of loss load has to be established for each bidding zone. Uh, and there's a more formal role here for regulators, since that has sometimes been missing. 
uh, ASA <coughs> has the uh, Association, Association of European Regulators has to uh, adopt an opinion where national assessments of adequacy deviate from the European assessment. Also, member states have to produce a market reform plan if they want to implement a capacity mechanism, um, and then that will be subject to the Commission opinion, and that has to happen before a capacity mechanism can be introduced for the first time. It also has to happen before new contracts can be signed in existing capacity mechanism. This is quite separate from the rules on state aid and the role my team has. This is sectoral rules that generally apply and would be enforced by DG Energy. There are also design rules that are separate from our design rules, which we have in state aid guidelines, but broadly consistent. There are design rules for capacity mechanisms now, so these rules apply regardless of whether it involves state aid. And that includes a restriction on the most polluting capacity and receiving capacity agreements. There's a 550 gram uh, emissions performance threshold, and above that, no more capacity agreements can be, can be granted to power stations in Europe. Uh, and then there's a requirement for, for a certain type of cross, direct cross-border participation in capacity mechanisms, and uh, NCOE has, uh, among many tasks, uh, the task of <laughs> developing uh, detailed, harmonized operational rules for this and for other aspects of, of capacity, capacity mechanism functioning. So that's what I wanted to say. I've put two links here. So the first one is a page we put together where we keep our case practice in one place for people, our case practice specifically on capacity mechanisms, so they can see all the decisions we've taken, the report on the sector inquiry, uh, and uh, well, the information we have publicly available about our work in this area. And here's a link to the clean energy package uh, legislation. One more thing that I should mention that should have included is that we have these, so we have state aid guidelines on, that apply in this area. There's also <coughs> state aid guidelines in many other areas. And DG Competition is currently consulting on whether those guidelines remain fit for purpose. Uh, that consultation runs until the 10th of July. And so there is a, that includes a more targeted consultation specifically on the rules in the energy sector. And so you are all very welcome to contribute to that consultation if you would like. Uh, and that could be an important input into future rules in this area. Thanks very much. <laughs>